feel that being here on this like the first nice night of spring, <laughs> it's Saturday night, that I am either with some of the most dedicated, committed people or the craziest group of people in the city. So uh, my idea about um, presenting this is that I wrote this report. I wrote the report because working with this uh, group of friends, some of whom are here tonight, called Cincinnati Progressive Action, we started fighting uh, the building of a new jail here. We live in a county with a declining population, a city with a declining population. We already have uh, many jail beds, and there was a desire by the Republicans in office to build 800 more jail beds in this city that's shrinking, in this county that's shrinking in population. And then the Democrats got elected to a majority of the county board, and they came back and presented this another version of fundamentally the same plan to build another 800 beds. And, and some of us who got involved in this, we put up some big money to fight this. I mean, it must have been a couple hundred dollars. <laughs> our, I see our treasurer of CPA is here laughing because uh, he knows that we put up a couple hundred dollars. But the opponents of this, the people who wanted to build the jail, who represent the political interests of the city, who represent uh, the police authorities in some sense of the city, who are linked to big contractors perhaps, or people who are engaged in running jails, put up tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars to build a jail. Well, when you run into something like that, you start to think, what's, what's going on here? Where is the power and money in this city? Who rules this city? What kinds of decisions are they making? And when that idea occurs to you if you're somebody who's been reading and thinking about these kinds of things for a while, you think of the book by William Donhoff, published back in 1968-69, called Who Rules America? And it was really, uh, to me, when I read it in 1968, I found it an eye-opener because it did sort of what a Christian suggested, that it takes this rather amorphous picture that, well, there's a lot of corporate powers out there, and it really kind of lined up the role of the big corporations in the United States. And I thought it would be useful to those of us who are activists in Cincinnati, people who are concerned citizens in Cincinnati, to ask the question, who runs our city? I feel my obligation here tonight is to, since you've come with that understanding, to give you kind of a little summary and overview in the hopes that some of you will join Christian when she goes home tonight to read this. <laughs> and that others of you who, uh, but, but so that's one part of it. I feel I ought to kind of summarize this report. A second thing I think I ought to do is to put it in another context, which is in the last few weeks, really, we've had a whole series, maybe a couple months, a whole series of economic reports where, which are saying that the United States may be entering uh, a really serious recession, depression. The word crisis is being used a lot. And, when we, and people are saying this will be the worst crisis since 1929, many people have said this, both nationally and internationally. And uh, the 1929 depression brought rates of 25% unemployment to the United States. Um, the great, you know, that was the Great Depression, of course. The 1981 depression brought a rate of unemployment of about 10%. Now, uh, as I'm sure you know, unemployment rates for African Americans in the United States are always double those for white people. So if we're talking about a 10% unemployment rate for whites, we'd be talking about 20% unemployment rate for blacks. We'd be talking about a huge social crisis in the country, but also in a city like Cincinnati. So I feel I ought to present this, but also come back to this issue of the crisis a moment. But what I really think this would be useful for is knowing that many of you are activists and many of you are people interested in these issues, to have a conversation amongst ourselves about, um, one, how could we change Cincinnati so that the corporate power is redressed, that there's a balance of power, uh, a better balance of power to begin with from those people who represent the majority of working people in this city. And, uh, and secondly, how will we respond if there should be a severe economic crisis here? I mean, the first thing that occurs to me is immediately to think of the experience of the early 1930s when people turned to organizing the unemployed. Some of you who work in a community like Over the Rhine are already engaged in organizing the unemployed, the homeless, and so on. Uh, so I try to work through this pretty rapidly, but just because I don't think I can cover all the details or cover all the numbers, I can only just kind of uh, 
uh, lay out the broad points. You can go online and read this document. Um, and then come back to the conversation, which I think is the most important point. And we can talk with each other about, uh, and amongst ourselves here, about what kinds of things can we uh, strategize about how to respond to this. So, um, to begin with, uh, that's what I just said. Now you can't see that, can you? So, but I can see it, so that's a good thing. So it says here, that I put up a, uh, into this report, um, some of the biggest corporations in the city. This came as no surprise to me, nor would it come as a surprise to you. And these corporations are Kroger, Procter & Gamble, Federated Department Stores, which is Macy's, Fifth Third Bank, Western Southern Financial, uh, Chiquita, American Financial, which is the Lindner Corporation, uh, Cintas, Convergis, and Scripps. These are the big Fortune 1000 list uh, companies that are here in Cincinnati. And these are countries that have revenues in the, uh, into the billions of dollars in revenues, profits into the uh, many millions. And uh, this is a Fortune 500 list, which is a little different, and it's, it's based on the region. And it would allow us to add to the local companies some I had mentioned before, such as AK Steel, uh, which is an important um, firm here and has been a very anti-union company as you are aware. Uh, I'm sorry, I had no idea you'd be so far away or this would look so small, but it wasn't the best plan. So I'll continue to do it this way. I also want to mention that there are um, several important banks that should be taken into account here, particularly Fifth Third Bank, which is the Cincinnati Bank. Other banks that are here, like PNC, Provident Bank, PNC, U.S. Bank, and First Financial, First Financial and Fifth Third are based in the area. The others are from are based in other cities, though they have a big impact. Um, one of the things that is really striking is the enormous amount of money that the heads of these corporations make. And this money that they're accruing annually, for example, Lafley, who's the chair and CEO of Procter & Gamble, makes $26 million a year. Uh, Lundgren of Macy's, 16 million. Ken Lowe of Scripps, almost 10 million. And David Dillon of Kroger, uh, almost about seven and a half million dollars a year. So these people are doing enormous amounts of money, which that money they can use in lots of ways. You know, that money is used not only to build their personal fortunes, but they can use that uh, in their donations to the arts, to politics, to museums, and so on. And wherever that money Goes, it has it has great influence. I think I, I tend to think the old English saying about uh, who pays the piper calls the tune that that has a lot of truth in it. Whoever's putting up the money, whoever is supporting organizations, is going to attempt to influence and if possible to control them. So these big corporations uh, play a big role in many areas of our life. The two richest people, the richest families here, are the Lindner family and Richard T. Farmer. Uh, Linder with $2.3 billion in uh, 2007, and Richard T. Farmer who had $1.4 billion in 2005. He's the Sintas. Uh, the Sintas. Uh, uh, one of the ways that, uh, this is a thing that doesn't form a big part of this report, but one of the ways that corporations, uh, that corporations have power is they have what we call interlocking directors. So sometimes people just call them interlocks. And what I mean by that is, if you looked at a corporation like Procter & Gamble, you find that members of its board sit on the boards of other large and important and powerful corporations. For example, um, Charles, these are some of the members of the P&G board. Charles E. Lee, who's also on the board of Marathon Oil. James McNerney, who's also on the board of Boeing. John Smith, who is a retired chair and CEO of General Motors, and also a retired chair of Delta. Um, Lynn Martin, who's a director of AT&T. So these are corporate interlocks. And one of the things this shows us is that these big, uh, the, the people on the, who are corporate CEOs, the people who sit on corporation boards, join with the people from other boards in regular meetings and regular discussions. And of course, some of you have been to a meeting, a social gathering, a conference, and when you go there, uh, you find, what do you do when you go there? You go out and have lunch with someone, you have a drink with them, there may be a social event. 
So through these board meetings and through their relationships, people are forming uh, a social group. They form a social class. I think they form what we can call an American ruling class. And this class makes uh, the fundamental decisions on these big corporations that are decisions about our country, that are decisions about its economy, that are often decisions about politics, decisions about foreign relations, decisions about warfare. Um, but I wasn't looking at that broader level. I was really going to try to look at the particularly more local level of these corporations. Now, when you have a corporation, the people in this, on the corporate board, exert influence over thousands and thousands of people, directly and indirectly. Most directly, of course, they hire the top managers, the CEO, the top managers of the company who are hired by the board, uh, who work in the central office. They also hire, of course, all the workers who work in industrial production, who work in service, uh, in the service, uh, if it's the service sector, who work in the many different aspects of the, the company. They, they own the physical assets of the plant. They control, if you think of a big company like Procter & Gamble, it is inevitably a giant real estate holder here in Cincinnati with many, many pieces of property. In addition to those two uh, big, uh, like big crystals set down there downtown, those two big P&G towers, they own many other pieces of real estate. So they're very important in determining not only their international policies, but also real estate. And a big corporation like this, when you start, of course, to think about it, you realize they have many lawyers who work for them, many law firms they put on retainer. Uh, law firms, their lawyers, public relations officials, or excuse me, public relations executives, copywriters, advertising writers, um, they have and many dependent companies. That is, any big corporation will have many, many partners, subcontractors, and so on. So taken all together, when you think of the power of a corporation, it is ramifying through dozens of organizations, maybe scores, hundreds of organizations, through thousands, tens of thousands of individuals who come under the influence of that company, who feel dependent upon it, who will very often defer to it. I often think, but when I think about this, um, I remember as a history student studying plantation slavery in the South. And the people who owned the southern plantations uh, directly controlled, of course, their land, their slaves that they owned, but also the smaller white farmers always came and deferred to them, right? The smaller white farmers knew that these plantation owners could roll over and put them out of business, that those big plantation owners uh, control the Episcopal Church because all those southern plantation owners were Episcopalians, and the, you know, most of them. Uh, the southern plantation owners uh, could dominate uh, the local government. The southern plantation owners became the senators and congressmen from the South who determined what happened in the South. I don't think the situation is very much different today. Our big plantations today have names like Exxon or uh, IBM or Microsoft, but they are big plantations, and those plantation owners have many, many smaller, the smaller farmers in their world are uh, the many subcontractors and small farms that work for them. And those people also, in our world, very often, they're the ones who make the big donations to the churches. The churches defer to them. Very often, uh, they will exert influence on uh, who makes up the church boards, uh, particularly in the larger national churches. I think the Baptists were being very democratic on the state of that. Um, well, they can come under the influence, of course, because they're small. They come under the influence very often. The Baptists become under the influence of the local money on a smaller scale. Um, if we look at any of these companies, like Procter & Gamble, Kroger, Macy's, or whatever, they exert their influence also through the role they play in controlling or at least influence, because it's always hard to use this word control. What does control exactly mean? But they bring their influence, they bring their power, they bring, they bring their programs, their desires to the boards of many organizations. Sometimes, if they're very important institutions, the actual CEOs, retired CEOs, heads of the companies, will sit on museum boards. They will sit on the board of the art school. They will sit on the board of the YMCA. They sit on the board of even Africa, what we think of as African American organizations like the Urban League, the most corporate of the black organizations, completely aborted, completely in corporate control. So, uh, so what we find is that the there's a famous novel uh, by Norris. Uh, I think it's about the railroad industry. Isn't it? It's called The Octopus. 
a great uh, turn of the century writer. But you know, we can think of this as the octopus. It's a famous analogy. We have a big corporation, and its many tentacles reach into all areas of American society. They will reach into arts, culture, social service, the black community, and so on. And so the, we find this here, and I can give you a couple examples of those. Uh, this is the Urban League that I already mentioned, and I know you can't see it, but um, Mark Walton of Fifth Third Bank sits on the board, David Dillon of Kroger, uh, Bradley Hinckley of Western Southern Financial, Daniel Gronick of the U.S. Bank, and Richard Moore of a law firm whose name I can't read because it happens to be going over the ridges there of the wood. Uh, but, the, but the thing is right there, four major corporations and one law firm made up the board of the Urban League. These may be African American people, and we will find that there are African Americans or sometimes other ethnic minorities who sit on the boards of some of these corporations. Some of them are professional board sitters. To be the, the black, and I don't say token black because he may be a very talented individual. The African American men and women, or sometimes there are women who have the same job to represent, to make sure that these boards have a, a uh, woman on the board. Uh, many of these people, I'm sure, are very talented and very experienced and very skilled and good businessmen and women and uh, this may deserve those positions fully well as anyone else. But the point is, they serve there not as a representative of the black community, they serve there as a representative of corporate interests. Um, and if we looked at, uh, I have I I oh, I put up the YMCA. And uh, the YMCA here has a, a large board. It has 38 members. But among those 38 members are Macy's, the Regional Chamber of Commerce, Luxottica Retail, which is a big corporation based in one of the suburbs uh, near here, Fifth Third Bank, Scripps, and Procter and Gamble. Now, there are 38 members of this organization. My experience, my observation is that when 38 people are sitting around the table and you're dealing with an organization that is dependent for funding upon, upon these corporations, I think that everyone's waiting to see what is that person in Procter and Gamble going to do, you know? How, what are they going to have to say? Where do they stand on this? Where's the person from Macy stand? That is, I think you recognize that sort of in the world of power in which we live, when those people express their opinion, it's going to have a great deal of influence because they don't just represent one individual on the board, like the person who's the social worker that's on that board or the person who's the physician that's on that board. These are people who represent tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. And their opinion is going to have a lot more weight and a lot more influence. And they can come to the board having had their attorneys, their public relations firms, and so on, present a package they will present to that board that will carry a lot of weight. So those are just two examples out of many dozens, I think, that are in that uh, study. I also wanted to mention that many of these firms all by themselves are quite capable of shaping the development of, of politics and society and economics in Cincinnati. But they don't just operate by themselves. They form blocks with other big corporations, especially when they really want to decide what's going to be the agenda for Cincinnati. And, and we have uh, the example of these big companies, again, P&G, Kroger, uh, Federated, Fifth Third, Western Southern, Chiquita, American Financial, Syntax, Convergence, and Scripps, who come together with many others to form the Cincinnati Business Committee. And you can find the list of the 40 or so members of the Cincinnati Business Committee. But the Cincinnati, the Cincinnati Business Committee is sort of the steering committee of the rich and powerful in Cincinnati. It is the executive committee of the ruling class of this city. And it's how decisions are made here. The Cincinnati Center City Development Corporation is, uh, is another um, organization that has been created by, these, by both those corporations and CDC with the notion of focusing its attention particularly on developing the downtown and the center of Cincinnati. So they developed programs intended to uh, change the character of this city, to, to remove people, to bring people in, to build new buildings, to get rid of old buildings, and they develop a program. Now they meet resistance in this community in particular and in other communities in this city, but it's important to recognize that these corporations form these blocks in order to drive the development here. Uh, this is complete, I'll be able to leave the I think. I put up here a couple of uh, 
a couple of the diagrams that deal with the, the financial contributions of these corporations. And I looked up, uh, I urge you to look at the report for some specifics. But Procter and Gamble, uh, and, uh, let's say the Pepper family, and Procter and Gamble has a pack, and Procter and Gamble makes many, many uh, donations uh, to candidates. You can look on there and find that almost all of them go to Republicans, except in Massachusetts, where Procter and Gamble has another fund that primarily gives to Democrats in that Democratic Party state. Um, the Lindner family, uh, American Financial Group, is the Lindners are identified as American Financial Group, and the Lindners give. Uh, well, give many, um, many hundreds of thousands, many millions of dollars over many years almost entirely to Republican candidates, though occasionally to some Democrat. But this is another important aspect of corporate power, that is, the corporations fund the big political parties, they make up, uh, they often sit on boards of these parties, they provide the funding for them, and Cincinnati is uh, no different. I, I should just mention that if you go and look at the, I went and looked at the contributions, you can go online and you can look at the contributions for all of the city Races. It's actually uh, it's actually a pretty good system. You can go to the, the city city of Cincinnati city council elections. It will tell you every candidate. If you put in a name there, like I put in the name Pepper, so you get all the Peppers who contributed to candidates. The Pepper family, uh, John Pepper, the uh, head of that former CEO of Procter and Gamble, or you can put in Lindner. I put in the Lindners. So you get a whole bunch of Lindner family members who are related to each other, and you can follow their contributions and who they give to. Uh, virtually everybody on the city council who runs for mayor here gets money from those uh, from those people to lesser or greater degrees, and they sort of hedge their bets. Uh, the Linders mostly like Republicans. Uh, the Peppers will sometimes give some more to Democrats, but they'll also give to to others, and, and they'll always, they'll almost always give a little to everyone. They want everyone to be somewhat indebted to them. And again, because I think who pays the piper calls the tune. But that's the the political influence. Of Corporations. Um, I thought it would be interesting in thinking that in the big picture about corporations have had a uh, have this tremendous control, and what does that mean in the big picture about American society? I'm just going to look at a couple of the results here because in this kind of talk I, we can't trace things out. But this is a chart that comes from the uh, uh, Economic Policy Institute that shows uh, productivity is that dark line that rises up into the corner and. This is the line of, uh, of wages here. So wages are stagnating and declining in the United States relative to productivity. That is, we live in a society where the corporations have been very dominant uh, for the last, uh, been dominant forever, but particularly strong since, um, uh, let's say, 1980 in determining American economic policy. And productivity rises. Workers work harder, produce more. We in the United States, uh, work longer than anyone in the world. Our hours are longer, the days we have off are fewer. I really, I'm saying to my students, you know, I say, uh, you know, I don't know what's the matter. I mean, in France, people have a four-week vacation on their first job from day one. You're entitled to four weeks. What are we doing here where you work for a, a two years very often, you get one week vacation. And even after five years, you may get two weeks vacation. We're the only people in the world that work this way. Our productivity is rising because employers invest in productivity is not really a matter of how much you sweat or how hard you work, usually how, how hard you push your pencil. It's really about it's really about the equipment that is available and the technology that's available. And employers have used more modern equipment to make us more productive. And yet as they earn more money, they are giving us less. Our, our real wages are falling. And there's new statistics on that in the paper in the last two days of falling. Uh, falling incomes in our society. And of course, the other thing that's happened is uh, this is a diagram of falling health insurance coverage. The little dotted line on the top is white people's falling coverage. Um, the thick black line is black people's falling coverage. And the bottom line is Hispanic people's falling coverage. So, health care, very important for most of us to make sure we have health insurance. Health care is being lost by workers who had health care plans through their employer, who had it through their unions. We don't have the same kind of health care coverage we have. People who have it are having to pay um, greater, uh, greater employee contributions to have it. it doesn't, it's not as effective. And you have greater deductibles, and it doesn't go as far as it has in the past. Hey, and how long was that? Over I'm sorry, I should have said that. Thank 
you for this is from 1979 to 2004. So 1979 to 2004. Um, this is a 2001 uh, pie showing who owns wealth in the United States as a result of this corporate dominated system we've had. The very dark green part there, or black part there, is that the top 1% control 32% of the nation's wealth. The next 4% uh, control another 25%. The next 5%, 12%. The next 40%, 27%. And the bottom 50% control 2.8% of the nation's wealth. So part of the result of this process by which you work harder, you don't get your share of the wealth, is that obviously those people who control these corporations who reap in the dividends are getting wealthier. What has this meant for Cincinnati to have a kind of corporate system of corporate <laughs> control that we have here? Uh, Cincinnati has become the third poorest city of its size in the United States, with 27% of Cincinnati's uh, citizens living in poverty. So this is a pretty extraordinary uh, level of poverty. Yes, sir. Is that the federal poverty guidelines, which I think for one person it's like ten thousand dollars? I think that's, that's what they point? used to do these statistics. Yes, these federal poverty guidelines. But if, uh, the, for one person it's ten thousand, but for a family four it's twenty thousand, something like that. Say about two for sixteen. So and I think what you think about what this means is uh, I had the experience myself as a kid to have my parents uh, divorce. And my mother suddenly found herself as a single woman who was working, uh, you know, moved to California, had no job, had to find a job. She ended up with only a part-time job, working in a bakery, taking care of two kids. And we were living in a little flat that had uh, no hot water and no bathroom in our little house. Three little, three little rooms. And, uh, and, so it, and as a little kid, it's a terrible thing to fall into poverty. And I think when you think of this, 27%, we have to think of all of the, we're talking about thousands and thousands of kids in Cincinnati who have uh, not, don't have uh, what they should have to eat, don't have the clothing they should have, they don't always have, certainly don't always have uh, what they need in their home. These are kids who are uh, white, Appalachian, and, and we're going to have a lot of them in the suburbs if we do have this economic crisis. We're going to have a lot of poor people who are people who think of them as white collar workers in the suburbs who are also going to go through this experience. And what happens, I think, to little children growing up in those families is a tremendous sense of a loss of self-esteem, a loss of self-worth, a loss of a sense of your possibilities uh, in life. And it's a terrible thing that, that we don't have uh, uh, what we should have here in terms of taking care of those kids. This is also the sixth most segregated city in the country, or was a couple of years ago. Uh, so this is, this is a few years ago. This is a highly segregated city, as anybody who lives here know. You know where the African-American neighborhoods are and how they're delineated and uh, where the Appalachian neighborhoods are. We don't always know where the African immigrant neighborhoods are because the African immigrants aren't so visible, but we now have African immigrant neighborhoods in parts of this city. Uh, there are Latino immigrants, many of them living in the suburbs, uh, in areas like Fairfield and Springdale, some of them living here in the Cincinnati area. Um, say in the area of a State or Harrison Street. We have many, it's a highly segregated city and without much opportunity for mobility or for people to uh, escape their, to escape poverty or to be able to have a community that rises with them or to move to another community. Um, I guess the, I think I've already mentioned this, but I would just like to then say, if this is the city we live in, and these are the kind of conditions we face, um, that is a city with a third of the people who are really poor, with uh, a working class whose wages have stagnated. And what is going to happen now if we have an economic crisis? When an economic crisis takes place, uh, as you know, employers will sometimes go, simply go bankrupt. Companies will close their doors. So we'll have thousands of workers who, because their company closes its doors, will be out of a job. Other companies uh, will reduce their workforce. They will lay off a percentage of their workforce and try to stay in business. Some employers, you know, will try to keep on as many employees as they can. They, they will say, I'm going to try to keep on this workforce here. Out of humanitarian sentiments, out of trying to keep their workforce intact so they can go back into business when things pick up for whatever reason. 
Uh, many workers will find their hours cut. So this is already happening. This was in the paper today. The hours of American workers are already being cut because of this recession. So people who still have a job are having less income. Uh, and of course, uh, some employers will now begin, to, if, the, if a depression gets deep enough, employers will come forward and demand wage cuts. They will come forward and say, I'm going to have to cut your wages uh, one way or another. Now this is something that would be radically new, I think, in the American scene, even for the last uh, 25 years or so. Uh, correct me if you think I'm wrong, but I don't think we've had so much wage cuts as we have had the contracting out and cuts in health benefits. But if you have a really serious depression, we could have a year of wage cuts. Uh, and this would happen at a time when we are right now seeing all these home foreclosures um, as a result of the bad loans that were made, uh, the benefit cuts that I mentioned. And we're also, at the same time, however, uh, seeing inflation. This is the experience that we think back to the 1970s. It was called stagflation, where you had a recession with rising prices. So we're now entering a situation where you may have people who are losing their jobs, but also they're going out to buy gas that's more expensive, food that is more expensive, and, and these are such complex issues, there's no doubt about it. That is, food is more expensive. Some people are now attributing this in part to global warming, in part to the production of biofuels, in part to the rising uh, transportation costs. So it, these are complex phenomena, but whatever's causing it, we're going to have many people who may not be able to go out and take care of their families. And I think we can see rising hunger in the United States because of uh, rising food prices. So I think that this uh, a crisis like this always represents a couple things. It represents immediate hardship for people, and it represents a, no doubt, a real challenge to people. And, and I don't mean to put this in any cynical way, I mean it in the best, I hope in the best sense. It's also an opportunity. When something like this happens, it means that people find themselves deeply challenged. In other words, I can remember hearing people, I went through the, as a truck driver in Chicago, I went through the recession of 19, uh, 74, 75, and I went through the second recession in uh, 79, I believe I was working as a, in a steel hauler in Chicago. So in this, in that uh, situation, you know, when you see people laid off, and you talk to workers who are laid off, people begin first saying, well, I don't understand, what's the matter with me, right? And we always know when you have these, these crisis situations, you have rising uh, problems of alcoholism, of mental illness, of domestic abuse and so on. And people are frustrated, they, they don't know what's the matter. People say, but there's a second stage when people will say, it's not what's the matter with me, I did everything right. I know, I worked hard, I tried to take care of my family, I've done the best I could. What's the matter with them? And who's the them? The question then becomes, what's the matter with my boss? What's the matter with my government? What's the matter with my society? And what can I do about it? And so I think, without being cynical about it, but I think that's an opportunity. Because people in that mode, in that, who are in that mindset, are looking for alternatives. They're looking for answers. And they're going to come and say, I want to know what can I do to change things so that I don't go through this again and my kids don't go through it. And I think then that opens up a possibility of saying to people, and we can make another world. We can make a different world. The world can be different. We can reorganize this society. But I think it also, you have to understand, we won't be the only ones saying that. That is, there will be people on the right who are saying, the problem is those Mexicans over there. There will be people who are saying, it's those blacks who brought this on you. There will be people saying, it's the Jews who did it, and so on. And there will be people who are proposing alternatives from the right. So I think that if this economic situation, which I pictured here in Cincinnati, of corporate control and its results, is exacerbated by an economic crisis, you'll find an era in which politics will become uh, you know, a lot more complex and challenging, interesting, difficult, and uh, and also provide opportunities for those of us who want to say there's another way. I, I think the potential forces for change in this city are pretty uh, are pretty apparent. African Americans have historically been a group who has gone in to fight first in many social movements over the last uh, 30, 40, 50 years. African Americans do not have the same confidence in the system. They're often more critical. Any of you who's ever done any leafleting on the street will know that people are going by and you're handing out leaflets, and along comes somebody who's a black man or woman, they'll say, what's in that leaflet? That is, they're more willing to have a discussion to find out what's happening. It's my experience over many years of being an activist. And so I think that, and we have something exciting happening in the city here, I think, in the NAACP, 
I think that since Christopher Smitherman became the head of the NAACP, he has really gone out and been a fighter on issues of racial justice and tried to, to build that organization, make it more active, more dynamic, and that's a very important development. Um, we have the religious organizations. Christian works for IJPC, one of the sponsors here that I, I want to thank. And uh, the IJPC, Intercommunity Justice and Peace Center, uh, which is based really on the support of many churches and headed by Sister Alice Gerdeman, a very important institution in keeping alive social struggle in the city. We have Amos, this coalition of many churches that has been involved in trying to, for example, uh, change what's happening with bridges. Um, we have the uh, we have the labor unions here, SEIU, which led this campaign to organize janitors, and uh, Unite Here, which have been a visible force on issues of uh, the hotel workers, not really local organizing efforts, but more the hotel workers who've been active in. Um, uh, the other side of the river and campaigns of solidarity in those hotels there. Uh, and we have the Worker Center here, which is another institution which has been trying to reach out to day labor workers and others uh, through uh, several organizing campaigns. And many community-based groups, and some of you here are from some of the Over the Rhine organizations, I think, the Over the Rhine People's Movement. And, but many community councils and many local activists are engaged uh, also. And then finally, uh, immigrant organizations, the Coalition for the Rights and Dignity of Immigrants, groups like Poday. Uh, we, have a, we have a lot of groups in the city, I, and I, sh I should say that I know as well, there are African immigrant organizations and uh, Arab immigrant organizations that are active in the city, with which I'm not so familiar, but I know they exist, and some of them working through uh, the International Center. And I think these are sort of the, the, the most obvious potential for change, but I also think one thing that happens in the kind of crisis that I talked about is, you get an upsurge of people who will kind of come out of nowhere. Um, people who are not affiliated with other organizations. Just because when there's an economic crisis like this, and when critical thinking starts to develop because people wonder what's happening, it starts to shake people out of their usual spots. And you start to get um, uh, students, young workers, uh, people from uh, many different communities, retired people, uh, housewives, whatever. many people will be shaken loose from their spot and say, I want to find out what's going on, I want to become involved, we ought to do something to speak to this emerging crisis. So uh, I think that uh, from my point of view, in, and I'd like to use this then to open the conversation, the most important thing if we're going to try to both criticize the existing powers that be here and develop an alternative, as well as to respond to a crisis, is that we have an independent movement. And I think it's very difficult to build an independent movement. That is, almost any organization that we work with, whether you're in the university, whether you're in a, uh, whether you're in some sort of NGO, whether you are involved in, a, in almost anything you're involved in, the corporations are the people who are funding it. And it's almost inescapable, and it's not, it's not to guilt trip anybody who, who's taking corporate money. No matter where you work, you are taking corporate money because it's a corporate society. And you hardly have any choice. But the question is, how within this system does one try to maintain as much independence as possible and develop a mindset that says, we're trying to organize a movement that is going to be independent of these corporations and independent of political parties. That is one of the interesting things to throw in here, I suppose, that would inevitably come into the conversation, so I might as well uh, see the notion here for the discussion, which is, uh, what happens to the attempt to build independent social movements during a national political campaign, and what happens uh, given the contest going on in the Democratic Party and so on. How does one, whatever you think of those candidates, whatever you think of those that electoral politics, how do you continue to build a movement that would be independent? I think that how do we create a movement of people who are activists in struggle? One of the things that we all face is you start to build an organization, you become overwhelmed with organizational responsibilities, and also with the element of social service that comes with many organizations. How do you create an, or an activist mentality? Um, and, and then I guess on this question of the building unity, how do you create a process to bring people together that's based on uh, mutual respect and achieving that unity through a process uh, based on a give and take? And um, I, I give one example we might think of as something we might do as my my uh, model example for discussion. If, if we're going to see an economic crisis, and if we see a rise in unemployment here, how might those of us in this room, and many who are not in this room, because many of those who are not in this room are people who would be important to this, obviously. Uh, how would we, let's take the problem of unemployment, how would we build an unemployed, unemployed movement here? 
That is, it seems to me, what is the nature of this economic system? It's the nature of the capitalist system to run on unemployment. Capitalism always has unemployment. It depends on a reserve army of labor that can be called in to do that work. But on the other hand, how can we speak to a, a huge increase in unemployment and fight that? How do we create such a movement? And then how, if we had a movement of the unemployed here, how would it be possible, and presumably linked to the employed, linked to unions, to influence politics and to build independent politics? I think I've thrown out every little element of you know, thing that we could make part of the discussion. I guess my, uh, and I think that's what I have to say. Um,